One of the groups my wife sings with is called Sway. It's a gathering of some very talented musicians over in Macon, and one of them is the son of Shelbina, Steve Wilhoyt. You probably know him as a Lieutenant Wilhoyt in the Highway Patrol. I know of him as the other guy who sings love songs to my wife. But uh, it's all cool. Um, but they were practicing some material uh, of song made, made famous by Eric Clapton, Wonderful Tonight. And as Olivia was telling me about this practice afterwards, she was telling me that Steve was frustrated because he couldn't get it just right. He couldn't get it perfect. He couldn't get it exactly like Eric Clapton do does it, which would be a challenge because there's only one Eric Clapton. But he didn't want to do this song, just wanted to let it drop because he couldn't get it perfect. And my wife told him to just sing it, get over yourself and sing it. And Steve, being a wise man, he did what my wife told him. And, uh, but it's an understandable impulse, right? You want to do something right. You have a sense of perfect, that this is how it ought to be done. And that's a word we're going to be looking at today, this sense of perfect, because we have this understanding of perfect, that to be perfect is this like flawless crystalline thing. It's exactly how it ought to be. There, there can be no flaw in it. To, to be working with a sense of you got, it has to be perfect is a challenge, especially if you're working with someone else who has a different understanding of what perfect might look like. But uh, be, perfect, I think it, it gets to be a challenge to, to, to think about perfect, especially when we hear Jesus say, be perfect. Whew. Are you, are you serious? Right? Jesus has just got done telling his disciples, you have heard it say, do not murder. I say, don't even give anyone flack. Right? You have heard it say, the, uh, uh, an eye for an eye and truth through truth, I say, turn the other cheek. Right? So Jesus gets on saying these things, and then he follows, uh, easy, right? Turn the other cheek, that's easy to do. And he follows it up with, and by the way, be perfect. I can't speak for anyone else, but speaking for myself, as someone who has a hard, hard enough time cooking an egg in the morning without cracking the yolk, right? I have a hard enough time getting through the day without unintentionally offending someone. If, you then, if I then read what Jesus has to say and it says, be perfect, I'm thinking, no. Right? That, that's not going to happen. Now, you might think this is a, a, a something like Jesus says once, it's kind of a throwaway line. Maybe I don't have to pay as much attention to it. Maybe it doesn't come up again. You'd be wrong. It comes up often. You read in Romans, while Paul writes, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you might prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. He writes again, in, uh, it's in Philippians, not that I have already obtained it or, or, or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I might lay a hold of that. Right, this idea of perfect, it comes up many times throughout the New Testament. We're not going to get to wiggle away and say, oh, we only heard it once, maybe it doesn't apply to us. Nope, there it is throughout the New Testament, perfect. The founder of the Methodist tradition, John Wesley, read this and figured, well, if it's, if it's there in the Bible, we've got to do it. So what, how do we start understanding this? How do we understand this call to be perfect? It's got to be possible because a teacher will not test a student on something that they can't do, and Jesus is a very good teacher. But the way that Martin Luther understand it, understood this call was to say, but behind every command is a hidden promise. If there's a command that you should do something in Scripture, there's the promise that you'll be able to actually do it. Jesus is not going to ask you to do something that you can't do. So there's the promise here that it is possible, but we have to be clear what per perfection means. It can't mean that we know everything, right? It can't mean that. I was talking to farmers earlier today who have hay in the fields. They cut it. They're ready to, oh, that didn't work out well, right? It, we're not going to make, we're not going to be perfect and know everything. We're not going to be perfect and never make a mistake. To be perfect doesn't mean that we're never going to get sick or we're going to be immortal or anything like that. To be perfect does not mean that we're never going to be tempted. Perfect has to mean something a little bit more practical. And here's, I think, the way to understand it. When Eugene Peterson translates the Bible, he has a translation of the Bible called The Message. This is how he translates this verse. He says, in a word, what I'm saying is grow up. Your kingdom subjects, now live like it. 
Right? Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously towards others the way God lives towards you. Right? I think that that's perfect. Right? In, in the New Testament understanding, in a word, grow up. Your kingdom subjects now live like it. In the New Testament, the word perfect doesn't have that same connotation and nuance that we think of it as being some sort of like exactly this way and no other way. Perfect in the New Testament has this sense of maturity. To be as mature and as, as wise as you can be for that moment in time. It's a moving target. It, it grows day by day. A Christian who is perfect is as mature as they can possibly be for how old and how much experience they have. Every person who follows Jesus, we are all called to grow and mature each and every day, to never stop seeking to be as graceful, as patient, as honest, as loving, as dependable, as peaceable as we can be, to be ever turning away from sin and towards following Jesus. Wesley sees this as the, the meat of salvation. We, we talked last week about how when Jesus knocks, we open the door, and, and that's the first step of salvation. We accept that Jesus offers us forgiveness, and we say, oh, thank you, Jesus. And then what happens next is we, we follow Jesus into his life, and we go out and we start following in his footsteps. And, and then as we follow in his footsteps daily, that is how we're growing up. That's how we're becoming more mature. That's how we're becoming perfect. The, 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 day, the day by day living following Jesus, that is the meat of, of, sang, of salvation, according to how Wesley argues, and I'm, I'm convinced by it. That's our very name. We're Methodists. What's that mean? We are attending to our methods. How are we following Jesus methodically, growing up, maturing day by day? It's a moving target, right? So. My two-year-old, we're working on potty training. That's exactly where he needs to be. My five-year-old, if we were working on potty training with my five-year-old, that would be bad, right? That, there's your, that's your example. You are to be as mature as you can be for where you're at. Does that make sense, this understanding of perfect? Any questions about that? I want to make sure we're all on the same page before I plunge ahead. Okay, so what does this mean for us daily? What does this mean for us today? I was thinking of this as I was reading the story of Peter. Now, Peter is the disciple who has the ability to speak when no one else is going to speak. If you think about Peter, when, when Jesus goes up to the trans, for the transfiguration and he's standing there with Moses and Elijah, two of the disciples are sitting there dumbfounded. <sighs> right? Peter's the one who says, hey, can we build some tents right here? Let's make a camp out. Right? When Jesus is walking across the water and all the other disciples are, are in the boat like, in awe. Dude, oh. Peter's the one that says, hey, is that you, Jesus? And, and come on out here, Peter. Yeah. And, and, like, he is always the one. When Jesus starts heading towards Jerusalem, he's the one who says what all the other people are, are thinking. Hey, Jesus, that's really stupid. And, and Jesus turns and gives him that great line, get thee behind me, Satan. Right? If there's ever a silence that, should, that may be or may not need to be filled, Peter is the disciple who fills it. I read about Peter, and I might see a bit of Peter in myself. I might see a lot of Peter in myself. Can't exactly tell a fib in front of your parents on this one. <laughs> now, does following Jesus transform Peter such that he becomes some sort of meek, wilting sort of... Mm. No. You read the beginning of the book of Acts, and the day of Pentecost happens, and, and, this, and someone has to speak to Jerusalem, and, and has to explain what's happening, and who is it? Peter, yeah, let me tell you about this. Let me tell the entire city. And, and someone has to go speak in front of the Sanhedrin, the government of Jerusalem, and, and who's going to go and speak? Any of the other disciples? Nope. It's still Peter. But Peter does not stop being outspoken. The difference is, as he follows Jesus, he grows and matures and becomes wise in how he is outspoken. Following and loving Jesus does not mean the brash person stops being brash. That brash person is now brash for Christ and grows in how to be brash, right? If you are quiet or if you're outspoken, if you are stubborn or you are flexible, whether you're completely introverted or you are extremely out extroverted, whatever you are, Christian perfection is not about changing what you are already, not changing who you fundamentally are. It's about taking who God has made you to be and growing in wisdom and how you use it for Jesus. 
you are each wonderfully and beautifully made. And nothing can change that. Christian perfection is taking what already is and making sure you grow in how you use it so that it is shaped out of your love for Jesus Christ. Growing and maturing as we, remember, knock on the door. Yes, Jesus, let me follow you, follow you into your life and getting wrapped up in your dreams, your desires. Growing in how we seek what Jesus desires. This understanding that Christian perfection is to be always growing and maturing, seeking to turn away from sin and towards Jesus, looking at Peter and his example, it helps us understand something essential about our task together as a church. How do we, as Christians gathering together, continue to grow and mature and to help each other to do that? Confessing and managing what is broken, because we all have parts that are broken, and developing what is wonderful and good in ourselves, being how do we help each other be the best you that you can be? How do we help each other become more the person that God intends you and calls you to be? For example, I'm continuing, like everyone has their characteristics. Let's say you have a temper. Anyone here have a temper? Don't look at each other. I, I know how it goes. I, I know someone in here has a temper. I would never look at someone who has a temper and say, that's it, you follow Jesus, you can never get angry again. That would be to deny who you are who God meant you to be. What I would say is, can you channel your anger at what Jesus gets angry at? Can you grow and mature in how you handle your anger so that it builds what Jesus cares for? Don't stop getting angry. Get angry with Jesus. Right? I'll tell, I don't have a problem with anger, I don't believe. I'll tell you what I have an, a problem with. This is a problem I've had for a long time. I have the ability to sound absolutely certain and have an opinion about everything. My dad once told me, thank you, Dad, you do not have to have an opinion about everything. Wise words to a very opinionated teenager, but I still sound like it. And so what will happen is we'll be going down the road, and all of you will ask, where do you want to eat? And I will say, let's go to Taco Bell. And I will sound absolutely certain we will be going to Taco Bell, right? And that's a problem because, hey, what, do you want? what I'm trying to say is, yeah, Taco Bell would be great. And I came off completely differently. And so we'll go to Taco Bell, and then we'll leave, and Olivia will say something like, oh, I'd like to go there next time, somewhere else next time. I'll say, well, why didn't we go there this time? Because you sounded so certain. I I I'm sorry. I have some growing and some maturity to do with that. Now, there are times when sounding absolutely certain is a good thing. I tell you with absolute certainty, you are always welcome at that table. I want you to know that. There, if anyone ever tells you you are not welcome at that table, they are wrong. Right? You, you hear that with certainty. That's a good thing, right? Growing, maturing, right? It's just a matter of knowing when to use that, that certainty that comes off so very easily. If we, ex everyone, we all have some growing up to do. <laughs> if we accept Scripture's call to perfection, that we are always called to be growing and maturing, and that this is what we, it means to follow Jesus, part of it, then what remains is to name what part of our lives we need to grow in. Right? How, how can you be the mo most patient you that you can be? How can you be the most respectful you? How can you be the most loving, the most understanding, the most humble, the most committed? How can you be the best you that you can be today? And do it in such a way that tomorrow it enables you to be even a little bit better. And, and notice that that is far more about attitude than skill. You may not be the wisest or the smartest or the most beautiful or the tallest or the shortest whatever person in the room, but you can be the most patient person in the room. You can be the most graceful person in the room. This is far more about attitude than it is about skill. I cook for folk. I, I can't wait to cook for, for each of you at some point. I love to cook. One day I, will be a, I might be a better cook tomorrow. One day I might not be such a good cook. I mean, I don't know but my ability to serve you humbly and patiently and kindly. It's the attitude that's going to matter, isn't it? And that's how I can grow and mature. When I was ordained, I was asked a question. I was asked the same question that every single Methodist pastor has been asked ever for 300 years now, and here's the question. Are you going on to perfection? All right, that's the question Bishop Schnazia asked me, and now I want to take that question. I want to ask you the same question. Are you going on to perfection? 
Are you growing up? Are you maturing and becoming ever more like Jesus today and tomorrow and the day after? Are you becoming the person that God calls you to be? Not someone mired in sin and anger and strife, but leaving that behind and becoming honest and loving and respectful and bold and gentle and patient. Are you becoming the best you that you can be, the you that God calls you to be? And if you're not growing in perfection this day, well, today is a good day to begin. Be the, be the person that God calls you to be, and tomorrow, by the grace of God, be just a little bit better. Amen.